Uh, my name is Sandra Toro. I'm a senior program officer in the Office of Library Services at the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and I'd like to welcome you to this uh, session, Evaluation 101. And I'm joined today um, by my colleagues. Amy Sagalkin is the director of the Division of Program Evaluation and Planning. Um, she's been with the administration uh, for Native Americans for almost six years and has worn many hats within that agency. Amelia Popham is a social science research analyst with the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. She's been with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for five years, and her work focuses on the well-being of low-income families. Madison Bowles, to my right, is a program specialist for di uh, discretionary programs at the Institute of Museum and Library Services. She primarily works with the Native American, Native Hawaiian Library Services grant opportunities. And she previously worked as a reference and user services librarian at the Environmental uh, Protection Agency. So uh, thank you for coming, and we will get started with Amy. Thank you, Sandy. Um, so my name is Amy Segalkin again. Um, I'm the division director at ANA. Um, I started out as a contractor at ANA um, as a program specialist managing the grants that ANA services um, and then became the uh, project manager for the contract that ANA has. And then um, just recently since February became the division director um, of the um, program evaluation and planning um, division within ANA. Um, so a bit about the administration for Native Americans. Uh, we're under the Department of Health and Human Services and within HHS there are 11 operational divisions, one of which is the administration for children and families and under that is the administration for Native Americans. Uh, ANA is a grant serving agency. Um, we service about 180 discretionary grants all community-driven projects. Uh, ANA's grants um, program areas are uh, social and economic development strategies, native language preservation, and environmental enhancement. So the programs that you guys might be interested in are the native language and preservation grants. Um, we have two program areas under native language. One is one of which is the Native Language Preservation and Maintenance, and those grants are a wide variety um, of projects that we serve. Again, they're all community driven, so whatever the community has deemed important to themselves in terms of maintaining um, or preserving their native language um, is what we fund. Um, it can be a wide variety uh, of curriculum development, teacher training, um, classroom education, et cetera, adult education. Um, and then we have the Esther Martinez Immersion Grant, and that's a narrower focus. Um, these grants have got to be three years, and you can only have a grant if you have a language nest, a survival school, or a restoration program. The language nests serve children um, seven and under, and the survival schools serve school-age children. You can find more about all of the um, programs that we serve at our website at acf.hhs.gov backslash programs backslash ANA. And then if you look under the programs tab um, under ANA, then you should be able to find um, information that you're looking for. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about you guys and your comfort level or knowledge of evaluation. Um, so before we get started, um, I, I just wanted to see, you know, how many in the room is evaluation new to you? You're just starting out in the beginning phases. Okay, excellent, okay. And then how many folks um, do you know something about evaluation, program evaluation, but you're always looking to learn more? Okay, great, probably about an equal amount. And then how many of you feel like you're an expert uh, in evaluation? Okay, great. Not shy, I see as well. <laughs> um, okay, so what is evaluation? Uh, evaluation can mean a lot of things to different people. A good high-level definition of evaluation is to determine the value of something. This definition encompasses a lot of things. Uh, you may do a feedback evaluation to learn what people thought of a workshop you gave, such as this one. Um, 
in this context you would be evaluating the value of the workshop for a grant for instance sometimes grant evaluations can also demonstrate whether the grant is having the effects and impacts and if you need to change course or whatnot so why is evaluation important evaluation this may be preaching to the choir as this lady over here but sometimes it can be helpful to revisit why evaluation is important let's look at the first point it can help you make decisions to better serve your population evaluation helps determine the value of your grant program your intervention or your services evaluation helps you understand whether your approach is working and whether you're achieving the results you set out to achieve not only does it help you make better decisions about your programming but evaluation also helps collect data to demonstrate your program is worthwhile this helps you attract more funding and support and partnerships and finally evaluation helps you be more efficient with the limited dollars that you have we all know that there's limited funding available to a lot of our programs and so doing evaluation can help identify those strategies that are working and so that we can put our funds towards those strategies versus strategies that aren't working I wanted to give an example of the Indian Child Welfare Consortium this is an organization that was an A&A grantee back in 2011 and they work with Native families in the Riverside County in California the couple that's pictured here was one of the grant participants and prior to this project the grantee itself the Indian Child Welfare Consortium noted that their service population had indices of spousal and child abuse they wanted to introduce concepts of healthy communication to their service population to hopefully decrease these indices they found an evidence-based healthy relationships curriculum called prep and they used an assessment survey and surveyed 116 participants before and after the project on a variety of healthy family indicators through this method they were evaluating the usefulness of the curriculum the assessment revealed that the parents who received the curriculum showed a decrease in parental depression and child abuse and positive changes in marital functioning and parent-child functioning this is an example of an in-house low-cost way of doing evaluation surveying the members that you serve now that they know that the curriculum works for them they can continue providing and know that they're efficiently using funds so what is an evaluation there's a there's a common perception that evaluation is only done by experts and the fact is there are many different kinds of evaluation there are varying levels of evaluation ranging from a process performance measurement evaluation to an impact evaluation and within these levels there is evaluation that is accessible to project managers who are still learning about evaluation like some of you in this room for example the logic model that will teach you in the coming slides is something that you can use to kickstart a performance measurement evaluation another common perception is evaluation is done by someone from outside of my community that who may come in to judge me the fact is that many tribes partner with evaluators that they know and trust and some who may come from the local communities some forms of evaluation are even participatory like the survey that I just explained um, and work side by side with the evaluators the next common per, uh, perception that folks have about evaluation is evaluation can be something to fear actually at ANA we get a lot of this anxiety about evaluation because our evaluators go out at the end of the projects um, and so that causes a lot of anxiety um, uh, that you know we're coming in for an audit or whatnot but that's not the case and it certainly doesn't have to be with evaluation evaluation demonstrates um, good stewardship of the funds that you have if you notice that you aren't having the intended impact you can change course got a little behind uh, the next common perception is that evaluation is expensive um, so it's not worth doing uh, anyway some evaluation is better than none um, low-cost basic level evaluations are available again such as the survey that I described with the Indian Child Welfare Consortium evaluation also helps you save money in the long run because you'll learn what's working and invest more in those strategies 
So we're going to go over the logic model in um, a, another few s slides. Um, but I, so I wanted to go over some defining terms. Um, and the, the first one is inputs. And what are inputs? Those are resources needed to conduct project activities, including the human, financial, organizational, and community resources a program has available to direct towards doing the work. These are items usually located in your budget. Um, they are, these are all of the resources that we need to get the job done. Oops. Sorry. Uh, the next are activities. Activities are actions and services that are part of program implementation. For example, activities may include creating projects such as promotional materials, curricula, uh, or services such as education and training or counseling or health screening. This is what we're actually doing with the inputs that we, that we have available to us. Uh, for l our language project, for instance, our activities might be delivering language classes. Outputs are the products or results of your activities. Outputs are generally phrased as completed activities and general number. For example, if your activity was to deliver language classes, then your output would be 14 language classes delivered. Um, you want to set your targets based upon the resources that you have, the inputs that you have available. For example, if you only have three teachers, then you set a target of classes based upon how much time those teachers have. Um, outputs are frequently the kind of numbers that grantees report out to their funders. With outcomes, outcomes are the final intended result of the activity, which usually changes in program participants' behavior, knowledge, skills, status, or level of functioning. The outcome is the whole reason you did this project to begin with. The outcome can also be your, your project goal. For example, in our case of uh, the language project, we want to see a change in the speaking ability of our students. That's the outcome. Your outcome usually also includes a target number, which is based upon the inputs, activities, and outputs you've specified. For example, if you know your inputs are limited, so you'll only be able to deliver language classes to one grade level, you would set a reasonable target for how many students in that grade level increase their speaking ability. So that was a lot. Um, so now we're going to do a series of activities, um, group participation. Um, so imagine that we're you know, sticking with the language project uh, example. Imagine that your language project is to increase the speaking ability of children enrolled in the tribal elementary school. All right. So this phrase, so what am I? Teachers for each grade level? Is this um, an input, activity, output, or outcome? Exactly. <laughs> it's an input because you need teachers, um, you need teachers to carry out the activities of the project, exactly. So the next one is native language curriculum. Is this an input, an activity, an output, uh, or an outcome? You're shy. Actually, the native language curriculum is an input because we're using the uh, we're using the um, curriculum to teach the classes. However, it would be an activity if the goal of our project would be to develop the native language curriculum. That would essentially be our output, but the activity would be. Uh, putting together the curriculum. So the next one is to provide instruction to children. Yeah, it's an activity, exactly. Um, it's, it's the what we're doing to get to the end goal. So the next one is uh, 500 hours of instruction in the language provided. Exactly, yes, it's an output. Um, so the next one is 20 children advance their language proficiency by at least one level. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. That's the end goal that we want of the project, is the outcome. I'm just going to skip ahead. So this is the logic model, and essentially, 
Um, so just going over the, what activities are, what inputs are, what outputs are, leads us to the logic model, which is a way for, um, to visually establish connections between your inputs, activities, outputs, and outcomes. Essentially, you want everything um, uh, to coincide um, with the, so your, your inputs need to lean to the activities um, that you have, and your activities should lean to your outputs, and so forth and so on to your outcomes to eventually achieve your outcome. Um, if you get down the road and you see you need to have more teachers to fulfill the number of activities that you propose in your proposal, then you may need to adjust your activities a little bit and maybe scale them down because you only have um, uh, you know, two teachers versus five teachers, which would be um, necessary to, uh, to achieve the uh, outcome of your project. With the logic model, um, and the logic model is in your handout. There's a blank one, and then one that's also filled out with the activities that we just looked at, um, with the items that we just looked at. Um, without a logic model, you might risk wasting time. This is something good to do at the beginning of a project um, to make sure that, that your project um, is, is gonna be viable. Um, and again, it's just a visual way to see the logic between all of the um, pieces. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, hi, I'm Amelia Popham, uh, as Sandra introduced earlier. So um, I work with Amy, um, also in the Department of Health and Human Services, Administration, and children, administration for Children and Families, um, but a different part of ACF called the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. So in addition to the ANA programs that Amy mentioned, uh, ACF funds a lot of other programs that you're may or, you probably are familiar with, such as um, Head Start, Child Welfare, Child Support, a lot of the social service programs aimed at children and families. And in the Office of Planning, and Re Planning Research, and Evaluation, or OPRE, we evaluate a lot of those um, programs, so we obviously work with a lot of tribal communities to do that. So ACF recognizes that a lot of tribal communities have an, a history of a negative experiences related to evaluation. Uh, historically, evaluation activities were often imposed on Native communities by the funding agencies um, from the view of the dominant culture. And these approaches often failed to recognize the sovereignty of tribes and also failed to take advantage of long traditions of indigenous ways of knowing, um, as a lot of you, I'm sure, know. Research was often invasive and offered little benefit back to the community. And in some cases, research even harmed communities or ignored community rights. So acknowledging that, um, but at the same time, knowing that we're seeing an increase in push for programs and practices today to be evidence-based. You've probably heard this a lot, right? Um, so we have this momentum towards building evidence, strengthening practice, and relying on um, data to guide decision-making is definitely of value. It presents unique challenges to tribal communities and the agencies and organizations that serve them. So since an attempt to reconcile these two kind of seemingly competing interests, um, ACF developed a tool to encourage a new way of conducting research in and with tribal communities. And we refer to this tool as the roadmap, and we hope that it will empower tribal communities to use evaluation to tell their stories and strengthen their programs. And that roadmap is what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. So I'm go in just a moment, uh, with the help of IT, I'm going to share a video with you that introduces the roadmap. Uh, this video is very beautifully narrated by Dr. Malia Villegas uh, from the National Congress of American Indians, and she does a much better job of explaining it than I could. Um, the video is brief, um, but Dr. Villegas uh, was part of the working group that developed the roadmap tool, uh, as was my colleague in OPRE, Alita Meyer, who wanted to be here today to present with for you, but uh, was unfortunately unavailable. So on this slide is a link to the roadmap itself. In addition to the video at the top, there's also a link to the roadmap itself in case you're interested in looking at it. Um, and then I just want to note as well that um, 
this resource was created by the ACF Children's Bureau so in the context of thinking about child welfare programs and evaluating them um, but we think the concepts here are much more broadly applicable it looks pretty confusing but it's meant to be a visual representation of the concepts of the work group and the roadmap and um, if you go on the website the, it'll be explained in much more detail in the roadmap resource um, and then of course you have it as your handout so as Malia said in the video the overarching idea of the roadmap is this concept of growing our own which means supporting training and career development of tribal members who are working to become evaluators and researchers or who already are and at the heart of this practice is another concept called bi-directional learning and what that means is that everyone should be learning in the process it's not a one-way street so about so tribes when they're working with an evaluator should have the opportunity to learn and develop evaluation skills for themselves and the evaluator should be learning about the community and the culture otherwise any evaluation findings they present are just going to be out of context and not you know not appropriate um, so as ACF has begun implementing this tool, we've already started to see some impacts of building up local capacity with our grantees around evaluation, and some of those, um, those impacts are here. So for example, tribal communities that we work with are better prepared to oversee and conduct evaluation and to consume evaluation information. So basically, what's the bottom line? Um, we just present this to encourage you to have high expectations for your evaluator, whether it's an internal or external person, um, to be a team member, to help build the capacity of your community to understand and do your own evaluations for your own goals and purposes. Um, and we share this roadmap as perhaps one option as a tool or resource that might help you do that, but of course there are many different ways. Um, Possible uses for the roadmap resource might be if you're a program or project director and you have an evaluator working with you to evaluate your program, you could share this roadmap with them and say, these are some of the principles that we would like you to adhere to in terms of respecting our culture and sovereignty. Um, or also maybe if you're a grantee, if you're thinking about applying for a grant with the Administration for Native Americans that Amy discussed, or with IMLS that um, you'll hear about shortly, you could use this as a reference in developing your evaluation plan for your grant. So here's contact information for Amy and for myself. And uh, with that, I'd just like to uh, turn it over to Sandra. Uh, my name is Madison Bowles, as Sandy mentioned before, and I'm a program specialist with the Office of Library Services at the Institute of Museum and Library Services, or IMLS. Uh, Sandy and I are here today to share information about IMLS, some of our discretionary programs, and how you can apply for IMLS grants and approach evaluating in your funded IMLS projects. IMLS is the primary source of federal support for the nation's 123,000 libraries and 35,000 museums. We make grants, conve uh, convene groups, conduct research, and publish in order to, to build the capacity of museums and libraries to serve the public. IMLS's vision and mission statements are the core to the agency's strategic plan for 2012 through 2016. And the emphasis, of course, is that IMLS is here to support libraries and museums in serving their communities. Uh, the IMLS vision is a democratic the IMLS vision is a democratic society where communities and individuals thrive with broad public access to knowledge, culture, her cultural heritage, and lifelong learning. The mission of IMLS is to inspire libraries and museums to advance innovation, learning, and cultural and civic engagement. We provide leadership through research, policy development, and grant making. Now there are three programmatic goals that drive the agency-wide grant making. We have learning, community, and content. Currently, we are undergoing lots of change at the agency, and although our strategic priorities remain the same, uh, you may be aware of OMB grant reform, also known as the super circular. Uh, this reform is changing how we issue calls for proposals, administer awards, and monitor and evaluate the awards. The goal is simplification, consistency, and transparency across all federal agencies. 
Now, along with this reform, within the Office of Library Services, we'll, we have been having what we're calling a f focus convenings to help us identify funding priorities within our discretionary programs. Now, I'm going to be going over some of those discretionary programs that we have, and some of you may uh, are probably familiar with them and maybe have even been awarded them at some point. Um, first, we have our Native American Library Services Basic Grant. Uh, which is a one-year non-competitive grant to support library and operations and maintenance. F um, now, the el eligible parties for this are federally recognized tribes, Alaska Native villages, and corporations that support the tribes and the villages. Um, it's a $6,000 with an additional uh, optional $1,000 that would support education and assessment. Um, this grant is really there to support library operations and basic library maintenance. Um, and it's, it's, it's annually. Um, our next grant is the Native American Library Services Enhancement Grant, which is also eligible to federally recognized tribes in Native, in, uh, Native Alaskan villages. Um, this is for projects uh, lasting up to two years, and it, the grant can be awarded up to $150,000. Now, this is a competitive grant. Um, so, as they are called enhancement grants, um, there are to, they are set to enhance existing library services or to implement new projects um, with the native library that pertain to such topics as education, digital literacy, language re revitalization, and cultural heritage preservation. Uh, and our third native grant is the Native Hawaiian Library Services Grant, which is also a competitive grant. Um, and this is also for uh, a time period of up to two years and to up to $150,000. Um, each of the, uh, so this supports library services and activities um, that go to a, a nonprofit institution that primarily, primarily serves and represents uh, the Native Hawaiian people. Now, each of the three grants that I just described, um, as I mentioned, are awarded once a year, uh, and we have our notification of funding opportunity um, is posted in uh, late winter, early spring, so you're looking at a deadline around March 1st, typically. Um, for each of these programs, you, you submit, uh, it, for the basic grant, because it's non-competitive, uh, you submit the forms and receive the money, um, but with the uh, enhancement grant and the Native Hawaiian services, you, you submit a complete proposal um, with the needed documents um, that are outlined in the Notice of Funding Opportunity, uh, and you submit these through grants.gov, and they're evaluated by uh, peer reviewers, um, and you're awarded later on in the summer. Uh, now, we also have three additional opportunities that are not focused for Native populations, but still may, may be a good option for your organization. Um, we first have the Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Program Grant, which uh, is for professional development, graduate education, and continuing education in libraries. Then we have the National Leadership Grants, or what we call NLG, um, which supports projects that addresses challenges and advances library practice that have broad national impact. And then we have a third grant, which is a slightly, a slightly smaller grant um, that really uh, is set out to encourage libraries and archives to test and evaluate uh, innovations that are going on in the field. I'm going to primarily be talking about the Laura Bush 21st Century, which we uh, call LB21, and the NLG. Uh, now, these grants are, um, have two funding cycles per year with application deadlines in early fall and early spring. Um, I'm talking about LNLG and LB21. Um, and we hold national convenings, uh, as I mentioned before, with the field's professionals to determine uh, what these grants' priority should be. Um, now, at this year's convenings uh, with our staff and stakeholders, we discussed two uh, priorities. We have the National Digital Platform and Learning and Libraries. Um, we are especially interested in supporting NLG and LB21 proposals that address these two priorities. Uh, now, the National Digital Platform is about expanding and improving digital content and services to all users in the United States. And we want to bridge the gaps between disparate pieces of existing library infrastructure so we can increase efficiencies, cost savings, and access. Uh, the National Digital Platform convening, which happened in uh, April of this year, focused on engaging, uh, engaging mobilizing, and connecting communities. 
um, as well as establishing an infrastructure for NDP and cultivating a digital library workforce. Uh, and as we have uh, listed in this slide and it will be uh, available for you, we have a link to the white paper that was, that was released from this convening. Now for learning in libraries, um, during, during the convening that happened in May for this one, uh, it was all about supporting work of all types of learning and inquiry, including participatory and hands-on learning in libraries. Uh, proposed projects for this priority should focus on how to support and enhance libraries' abilities to make their own decisions and their own investment. Uh, the Learning in Libraries convening took place uh, in May in Kansas City, as I mentioned, and focused on the connection um, of library information science education with 21st century librarianship skills. It also focused on designing participatory learning programs that are not only innovative, but also scalable. Uh, through this priority, we also wanted to develop uh, partner library services everywhere. Y and you can find the white paper as well to, for this convening on our website. Now I'm going to pass it over to Sandy. Thank you, Madison. Um, so one of the reasons that we were talking about the National Leadership Grants and the Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Program is that we're interested in diversifying um, the applicant pool and hopefully uh, some of you in the room will apply for these programs in the future. Um, and in general, um, the national leadership grants uh, support challenges or support projects that address challenges faced by libraries and archives that have potential to advance practice in those fields. So uh, successful proposals will generate results like new tools, research findings, models, services, practices, or alliances that can be widely used adapted, scaled, or replicated to extend the benefits of the federal investment. The Laura Bush program supports professional development, graduate education, and continuing education to help libraries and archives develop human capital capacity um, that they need to meet the changing learning and information needs of the pub American public. So in general, if your project has to do with educating professionals, and supporting research in academic settings, you're gonna apply for the Laura Bush program, and everyone else pretty much fits within the National Leadership Grants program. So you're thinking more about daily practices and learners like family groups, uh, young children, uh, and others who would go to libraries and use their services. If you go to our website, um, it looks brand new from what you might have seen two days ago. Uh, a new site was just launched yesterday. Uh, you can find information about the different grant program programs that uh, Madison talked about, as well as how to contact program staff uh, and the links to the new notices of funding opportunity. By clicking on the grants tab at the top and then going to the tab that says apply for a grant, you can get all of the detailed information that you need about NLG and LB21. Um, and some of that is, for example, uh, the dollar amounts. So for NLG, you can request up to $2 million. And for LB21, that's up to $1 million. Planning grants are up to $50,000 for both. And national forum grants are up to $100,000 for both. And Laura Bush has um, specific categories that you won't find in the national leadership grants, um, like uh, programs to build institutional capacity uh, and early career um, development. Also on our website, uh, you'll find a section about research and evaluation. In the evaluation section, there are lots of resources that can help you think about which kind of approach you can take in terms of evaluating your project and how to talk about your approach in your proposal. So at IMLS, we're not prescriptive. Um, so that is, we don't require a certain kind of evaluation um, or that you hire an outside evaluator. We do require that you have an evaluation plan and that you describe how you'll go about tracking your progress using new performance measures um, that will apply for all projects funded starting in 2016. 
So from our point of view, successful evaluations actually start with successful project proposals. So to put together a successful proposal, we want to make sure that you address an agency-wide goal, um, like the ones that Madison talked about at the beginning, like learning or community, and a program-based priority like learning in libraries or the national digital platform. So you want to make sure that your proposal includes information up front that shows you're familiar with other projects that are happening in your area of interest that could be language development among uh, children or another topic like STEM and tribal communities, including uh, knowledge about research and education projects. Uh, so both information that's published and projects that may not have published findings but that have been ongoing. So if you go to our website, you can use the awarded grants database search function to find these projects. And be mindful that your project can be implemented for your local community, but it must have potential as a national model that can be replicated and adopted by other organizations. So this means that you have to think about how other people can do similar work without receiving a grant. In addition, you have to make sure that everything that is created by you and your project team is open source and accessible, um, like Mary Alice Ball uh, talked about this morning. We require that you share all digital work, and you'll be asked to fill out uh, what's called a digital stewardship form when you put together your full proposal. But when you begin, uh, you should start by reviewing the reports from the focus convenings that Madison mentioned, and also work with other professionals to develop practical collaborative responses that are well situated in that available research and practice. You can identify uh, project directors and partners and ask them to serve as advisors who can bring expertise to your project and give you feedback on promising uh, strategies. So we ask that you outline your proposed work plan and make sure you have an approach that makes sense for your team in terms of measuring potential impact and value to your organization, to the local community, and other beneficiary beneficiaries from the broader field. So when you talk about relevance to one of the two program priorities, the National Digital Platform or Learning and Libraries, talk about potential impact in terms of the projected outcomes um, like Amy mentioned at the beginning of the presentation uh, today. So finally, um, provide some information in your proposal to show that you can manage an award. And that means including a budget that shows you're aware of what's doable and realistic and that you're familiar with what's allowable or unallowable. So for example, we can't pay for food unless it's during a working meeting. So you can find examples of successful proposals on our website or get in touch with us and we can help you directly. So it's something that you'll, de you'll see discussed in our notices of funding opportunity is the idea of de demonstrable results. So in our uh, program information sheet, which is just a form that you check off, you'll see um, this question number four. So this is where you would pick one of the agency level goals like learning, community, or content and collections. And then you'll also see um, later on what you have in your handout, which has to do with the performance measure statements. So this is where you would try to get some information from your participants, um, like whether or not they feel their understanding has increased as a result of participating in your program or uh, whether or not they feel their interest in the subject of the program has increased as a result of participating. So in addition to qualitative descriptions or narratives where you tell us what happened, you'll have to document your progress toward achieving your goals. Um, and that goes back to the goals that you identify um, in this program information sheet. So um, this is just a sample, but before you even start thinking about evaluation, um, you have to select one of these goals and that helps get you started. Over the course of your project, if it's longer than one year, you'll have to submit interim and narrative reports. So in addition to talking about what happened, including describing lessons learned and next steps, you'll see charts like these uh, in these report templates that you have to submit each year. 
And these reports tell us which activities were proposed, which activities were completed, and if there were any changes, what they looked like. So if you think about some of the activities that Amy um, gave as an example at the beginning, um, that's the kind of thing that you would be talking about. And if some of them didn't happen or if they changed, you just have to tell us why. We don't fault you for not completing certain activities. For learning and community pro projects specifically, um, you're going to look at what you submitted in your proposal, and you're going to look at the performance measure statements, like the ones that are on the handout, um, and just chart, uh, you know, what the measure statement was, uh, who you got the uh, results from, who participated, whether they were program participants or community partners. Um, you're going to record the number of partners, the number of responses, the number of responses per answer, and how many people didn't respond. So these are very simple um, ways to track your progress, and it's just one part of what we ask you to do, um, but it's, it's very um, very simple, just tracking numbers. On the other hand, what we want you to do that's much more interesting to us, uh, which is not required by OMB as part of that su super circular and tracking um, your measures in the way I just described, we want you to have a plan. So how do you know what to include in your evaluation plan? Your plan for tracking and measuring success and achieving results is the one significant element in the review process um, that we're concerned with today. So for that plan, you should include very specific um, and sufficient resources that are dedicated to the evaluation activities in your work plan, in your budget, and in a schedule of completion. So you can include whatever costs you feel are appropriate, and that can be for consultants or your own staff, for staff time to develop tools and instruments like surveys, or maybe there's a task that you'd like children to complete to show that they've acquired some knowledge or a skill. Um, and you also want to include funding for staff time to collect information and analyze evaluation data. So you inc include these costs uh, for your evaluation, for your reporting, and for sharing your project results in your project budget. You can budget these costs as grant funds or as cost share. And um, we ask that you keep in mind that effective evaluation strategies often use multiple techniques, not just to measure and analyze the final project outputs and outcomes, but also to inform and help share your project design as the project progresses. So that's a lofty goal, and to help you um, with that process, we are going to have a new portion of our new website um, that will be up within the next few months, and it's being developed by the Office of Policy and Analysis at the Smithsonian uh, Institution. And you'll see here just a sample of the different kinds of resources that will be made available. So they'll be providing very detailed information about some of the terms you heard today, like inputs and activities and outputs and outcomes. There will be resources to help you come up with specific goals for your evaluation, um, for determining what the right methods are. Do you want to use qualitative or quantitative methods or both? Um, they'll help you understand how to use sampling and different kinds of sampling, and they'll have links to resources that you can find online, like guides to managing um, evaluation from different organizations. So it's not ready as part of the new launch of our website that happened two days ago, um, but it should be up within the next few months. And if you give me your contact information, I can let you know as soon as it's online. And with that, I think we can um, take questions either for Madison and myself uh, about IMLS or from Amy and Amelia about um, the first part of their presentation. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming.